look, let's start with the voluntary administration of Australia's third biggest domestic airline, Regional Express, better known as Rex. It's the second airline after Bonza to collapse in barely three months. The political problem for the Rex collapse is that regional communities risk being isolated if the airline simply stops flying. For now, those regional flights do continue while the administrator, EY, investigates the airline's viability. But its capital city 73 servant services, which challenge Qantas and Virgin, already have stopped. Well, this week, the former chair of the Productivity Commission, Peter Harris, who chaired the so-called Harris Report into airline slots at Sydney Airport, gave a stinging rebuke of both political parties for their tardiness in cleaning up a mess that's made life almost impossible for any challenger airline. Both the transport ministers in recent times, since I finished my report, uh, early part of 2021, uh, have really been, you know, uh, incredibly bad at not progressing this. So the report, you know, it, it, it's not that it was an easy to implement thing, but it was designed to be implemented progressively and in sensible stages, starting actually with regional aviation in New South Wales, which has been frozen for 25 years in its slot allocation arrangements at the airport. And so even if you move beyond uh, just the fact that Rex entered into uh, the Sydney, uh, uh, Melbourne, Brisbane Triangle, as it's called. Beyond that, uh, Rex has had problems getting allocation of slots for its regional routes as well. And neither the previous government nor this current government chose to deal with that. But the story of Rex and its financial failure goes right back to its beginning in 2002 from the ashes of another airline collapse, ANSET. It owned the regional carriers, Kendall and Hazelton, and it was due to the effort of a small group of people led by Michael Jones, who worked on a rescue bid for ANSET, that Rex was born. Michael Jones knows what it's like to, for an airline to run out of cash. 18 months after Rex started, it was on its knees again, and Michael Jones resigned. He had 12% of the shares. It was then rescued by Singapore investors Lim Kim Hai and Lee Tian Su, who ran the airline until early this year when they too were forced out. So I spoke with our special guest, Michael Jones, the founder of Rex, a little earlier. Yeah, it's very sad, Ross. I mean, it was one of those things where, you know, not that it counted for anything, but we were always to claim, myself and the small team that we worked with, which bought Kendall and Hazleton from the administrators and reformed the airline and took it through, you know, we could always say that, you know, we created a great airline and it was still running and there were very few people in this country who could say that. Now for it to have failed, um, you know, we're sad. And my phone has basically blown up the last two days with contact from, you know, previous people who've worked there in, with me and as executives, um, current board members and a number of staff who I know. And it is a sad thing in the history of Australian aviation this happened because I think Rex was, you know, a pretty good airline basically. Um, but there were some fundamental problems that have been there for a long time, which have really come to a head. And this board fracture has really highlighted that. Because that's the, that's the history of it. The board fractured. Lim Kim Hai was forced out as the executive chair. Now, something clearly has gone wrong at the board level, which means that the funding also ran out. But it's also clear that Rex was losing money. And that came from some of the capital city routes that it had started to fly to. And then the issues of Peter Harris raised about slot hoarding at Sydney Airport also then come to the fore. Yeah, I think it would be a pretty obvious comment to say that airlines are some of the most complex businesses on this planet. And, you know, the current developments, growth and sort of opportunities that Rex was trying to execute um, weren't done well. Um, their marketing, the ability for the fair paying public to see Rex as a alternate choice. Often when you would search for a flight from Sydney to Melbourne, Rex simply wouldn't turn up on the search. And so that was part of, you know, what a lot of people thought was going to be the inevitable, you know, cause of Rex's demise in trying to challenge uh, Qantas and Virgin on, you know, the Golden Triangle and the main trunk routes with its 737. But those characteristics aren't new. Um, in your preamble at the beginning, you mentioned about, you know, about 18 months after we, we started the airline, which was on the 7th of July in 22, um, you know, 18 months later, we, we started to get a funding crisis again. And the reality is, and it's never been spoken about previously because of people concerned about defamation and other things like that, but that was basically caused by Lim himself. He orchestrated that by, against the shareholders' agreement, buying additional shares 
blocking supply in trying to get control of the airline. And ultimately, when the airline floated, you know, he owned about 76% of the airline. And, and that was a situation that was pretty hard to handle for a lot of people. And the board, even back then, and I stood down from the chairman's role and put in a guy named John Hindmarsh, and he and Lim, you know, came to blows one day. And, you know, there is a board member who I won't name of the current board who said he's the rudest and most arrogant person they have ever dealt with and that, you know, his departure was an ogre leaving the building. So not good signs when, you know, 22 years ago that was happening and it's happening or happened again now. And so that's a big contributing factor. I mean, in my role as the chief strategy officer at Virgin a few years ago, we met with Lim and the management team to talk about um, interline and operational things like that. And again, it was an amazing meeting. And I had pre-briefed our head of uh, commercial at that time to, you know, brace himself for a unique meeting. And when we walked out, he, he said, I didn't know what you meant, but now he said, I'm amazed. I've never experienced anything like that. I mean, Lim was very proud of saying, I don't do strategy. Um, I make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can't do that in complex airlines. Um, you know, he, he did an amazing thing and build the airline up and get it to where it was, but there were some fundamental flaws and cracks in their business plan, which ultimately is the cause of the downfall. And, and do you get a sense that after he was forced out as the major shareholder, he was saying, no more money, I won't prop up these losses, and that has actually then exacerbated the, the fall, the decline, into this administration that's currently seen? Yeah, I don't know the fine details, so I would probably mislead, you know, the viewers if I, you know, made commentary on exactly what happened. But I know that PAG, with their convertible note, you know, held some of the strings and the control of this. And I think some of the related party transactions which have come out in the media in relation to National Jet Express and, you know, Lim buying it from himself and his brother-in-law, um, you know, those things often make board members concerned and other shareholders concerned about their own legal liabilities of, are we going to get caught up in a false and misleading conduct um, charge here or what is going to happen to this? So I think it forced their hand. Um, and I think Lim also plays brinkmanship all the time. And I, I would guess, and it is only a guess, that that's what's happened here, that in the supply he said, I'm, I'm not going to put any more money into this, I'm controlling it, etc. Um, and it's caused the downfall. But you know, it's amazing. The arrogance of this guy cannot be understated. You know, more than 12 months ago, there were a number of parties who had um, engaged advisors and were looking, because of the share price of Rex, they were a potential target on the market. And he just wouldn't deal with anybody unless they were prepared to pay his exorbitant $300 million that he wanted, which is a completely unsustainable and, you know, unjustified price. And so those people basically walked away. But that could have been the saviour of the airline. But that really typifies the guy. OK, just tell me one thing. I've, I've heard something that you potentially could have been involved with Bonza. Of course, Bonza has now collapsed as well. Just explain the background of that. So, obviously, uh, in my background, you know, in airlines and for most of my life been involved in aviation, uh, we were approached by this consortium who initially said, hey, we'd like to engage you and Paul Scurra um, who worked with me on Rex in the early days as our head of commercial. And I'd sort of been introduced to Paul when um, I was the sort of running ANSET in administration. And he was the senior commercial guy there and he was a really good operator. So he and a number of other guys, Darren Dugan and Guy Farrow, we formed the team that sort of did the Rex deal. And so we were approached basically to say, do you want to get the band back together and, and buy Bonza? Because we think there's a deal there. And universally to a man, we all said, that's crazy. That is the worst and most ill-conceived business concept that we had heard about. Bonza was, was, was not a good business plan. But we said there is potential to, you know, polish Rex up, to sort out the 737 operation, to improve its distribution and sales, um, improve its network structure and network density. Some of those slot issues that Peter Harris talked about before, if you fix that, you know, the airline, you know, could be really successful. And so for a while, the, we, the team was put together, as I said, and we were working out the recovery business plan. But um, Lim put paid to that because he just wouldn't deal with anybody unless you were prepared to pay his extortionate thing. I mean, 
the, I know from our the perspective of our consortia, you know, we were prepared to pay, you know, twice what the market cap was and give shareholders a double return on the existing share price. But he wouldn't even entertain it. it you know, it would have had to have been a very hostile takeover in order to, uh, to undertake that activity. So now that Rex is in administration, just one other aspect of this, is it possible that you could get the band back together again, that some of those players could come back with the administrator to try and bring Rex back to, to the glory you imagine it could have been once? Uh, there, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there was a, you know, a small part of me that, you know, part of my DNA is in, in the, what we did to get Rex from the ashes of the administration of ANSET and to get it going and survive SARS and the funding crisis and get it to afloat. And, you know, when I left, it was the most profitable airline by a margin in the world by a, a long way. And it had won 26 global awards as the best regional airline. So there, there is still that, you know, pride and sort of attachment. And I think the overwhelming sentiment that everybody, you know, has expressed to me over the last few days is sadness to see this happen. But the reality is, and the hard coal reality is, I think the 737 operation was where the potential upside from a business perspective was, but that's now gone. I mean, that can't be recovered. And the lifeblood, which was the airline of, you know, what was 50 aircraft you know, regionally and then 66, you know, in its more current form, it has fallen into a bit of a disarray because the Saab 340B, which is the primary platform for all of Rex's regional operations, that aircraft is becoming really hard to sustain and it needs um, an upgrade over time. And so whether the airline can afford that, whether the regional market is buoyant enough to do that, they're the challenges. So that's a long way of answering your question and say, you know, never say never, but the answer would be no. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not looking to step into the breach to recover Rex. I'm pretty busy doing what I'm doing now, thanks. Well, I was going to say, what you're doing now, and it is keeping you busy enough, is setting up a space company, effectively a space launch company based in Arnhem Land, which is, again, a pretty ambitious project. Yeah, I didn't... Um, this wasn't the kernel of my idea. I didn't start this. A friend of mine who I'd worked with um, in space projects, you know, a long time ago, had started this business, and they were basically insolvent and said, can you help us? So, you know, it sounds like this is a bit of a common theme in my life, and it, and it probably is. So I came in and took over the business. We launched um, Australia's first commercial space launches from the Arnhem Space Centre in 2022, just over two years ago. And since then, we've been um, building in and expanding the, um, the spaceport in, in, in Gove um, to the point where, you know, it's the most advanced and probably the largest multi-user commercial spaceport you know, in the world. And we, you know, uh, have a number of contracts for launch and, you know, it's got a very, very bright future. It has its own challenges. Um, doing a space infrastructure business as a startup is a fairly ill-conceived concept, um, but we're getting through it. We've been really well supported by our existing shareholders and investors globally, and our customers really like what we're doing. And so we've got yeah. pretty good commitments from most of those. Yes. And, you know, we will start off over the next few years doing a few launches, but probably get to sort of 80, 90 launches a year, you know, by 2030. And, and it'll be a good business, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'll tell you what, Michael Jones, great to have you on the program today. Many thanks for your insight and I really appreciate your time.